white text over video of past events. Logo, Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Professional Development Series presents What Can a Body Do? Access Book Club with Sarah Hendren. As the program begins, a woman speaks directly to us. A note that while the program mentions ASL interpreters being available, they are not present on this recording. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Kosner and I am one of the three co-chairs for the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. And I wanted to thank you all for coming today and welcome Sarah Hendren, who is the author of What Can a Body Do? How We Meet the Built World. Before we get started, I'd like to give a visual description of myself for any attendees who can't see me. I am a 30-something white woman with shoulder length, curly brown hair. Behind me is a white background with the CCAC logo in the upper corner. Um, I'd also like to note that I do use she and her pronouns. Just a note on access features available during today's program. Actions are available by clicking on the CC button and selecting View Subtitles down at the bottom of your screen. We also have American Sign Language Interpretation, which will be available throughout the program today. You should be able to see that without clicking on anything special. If you have any trouble accessing these features or have any other questions, you can use the chat box to reach out to our Zoom logistics team. All have CCAC listed before their name. So you'll see CCAC, Hillary, Karen, Emma, and Risa. That, those are your tech helpers today. I'd like to welcome you all today and share some information about CCAC and the ways we can help you with your accessibility work. CCAC's mission is to make Chicago's cultural spaces more accessible to people with disabilities. We achieve this with three main offerings. We have an access calendar, which lists all of the accessible cultural programs in Chicago, an equipment loan program operated in partnership with the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, which loans accessibility equipment for totally for free to organizations who are unable to purchase their own. And then we have our free professional development workshops for cultural administrators like this one. CCAC is an entirely volunteer run nonprofit. If you're able to support our work now or in the future, please visit our website at chicagoculturalaccess.org and make a small donation. Every little bit helps and we really do appreciate it. I also wanted to let everybody know that in January, we're going to have a program focusing on the intersection of race and disability. This is likely gonna require a bit more of a commitment from attendees than our programs typically do. And I have been told there will be required homework you have to complete in advance, just a heads up. Uh, registration isn't quite ready to be open for that yet, but you can keep an eye out for it on our website, again, chicagoculturalaccess.org. And if you're on our listserv, you'll get an email announcement once registration has opened. So with all of that, we are ready to dive into our program today. I am very excited for today's guest speaker. Sarah Hendren is an artist, design researcher, writer, and professor at Olin College of Engineering. She's the author of What Can a Body Do? How We Meet the Built World, which was just published in August of 2020. Her book explores the intersection of our physical bodies and the built environment around us. Her work invites all of us to think a little more deeply about how we can make our cultural spaces accessible and really question the structures and systems that create barriers for people with disabilities. Sarah will be sharing her presentation with us today for about 45 minutes, and then we're gonna have some time for questions afterwards. We're gonna be taking questions today using Zoom's Q&A feature. So if you have something you'd like to ask, you can drop it in there. And then our team will be collecting all of those questions throughout the program and I'll be asking them afterwards. And with all of that, I am happy to turn today's program over to Sarah. Anna's video is replaced by Sarah's. Thank you so much, Anna. And it's really great to be here with all of you. I am Sarah Hendren and I'm a middle-aged white woman um, with long shoulder length brown hair, not benefiting from a haircut anytime recently. And uh, behind me is a, a stack of books on a bookshelf, including many publications um, kind of adjacent to my field, Jaipreet Verdi's um, Hearing Happiness, Bess Williamson's um, Accessible America, Amy Hamry's um, building access, so many other titles, and a big abstract painting by my brother, uh, David Hendren, that's keeping me company on endless hours of Zoom. Um, it is really great to be here with you all, and I'm going to share some slides today um, that I'll talk you through in, in a moment. Um, 
but uh, it's especially a pleasure to be in a space where there are so many people who are both knowledgeable and have organized a bunch of political will around access. And so I've organized the talk today on a couple of different levels, not just our shared topic of disability and design, but also how we frame the topic of, of disability and design for folks uh, who we work with, the constituencies we work with, our various kind of collaborators and audiences and our own positionality and, and so on. So I look forward to um, Q&A with you. I'm gonna just share my screen now. Um, so you should see just the title of this talk, um, What Can a Body Do? White text on black background. In the top right corner of the screen is a mini video of presenting speaker. I'll just get going here um, with this kind of opening question. So yes, what can a body do is the title of the book and also a kind of a question that's been hanging over my work for the last decade. But I'm also thinking about this question all the time, practically speaking. Next slide. What can design and design writing do? And I mean that in the socio-political sense, in, a, in building the worlds that uh, we want to see, the desirable worlds that we want to see. Next slide. So with that in mind, I'll spend a little bit of time today talking about the places where design and disability meet as a kind of topic. And then I'll also dwell a little bit on design practice and design writing as a civic work. How, how does it make shape itself to do that civic work? And I'll be interested to hear what your experiences are. Next slide. Um, that last piece, that kind of uh, writing piece, I'll organize around Danielle Allen's notion of reframing, which she calls prophetic reframing. And I'll just ask you to keep that word reframing in mind, because I'm going to come back to it at the end. But that has been a rich source for me for thinking about what design can do and what design writing can do, uh, not only when it comes to um, accessibility, but certainly um, including that. Next slide. So this is a title of the book. Um, this is an image of the cover of the book. And it is uh, in yellow and black, high contrast. But the title, What Can a Body Do? And my name as the author um, are in black on yellow and they're bleeding off the edges of the jacket of the book. And this is a kind of question that was packed in to the jacket design itself, which is to say, is that lettering too big for the real estate of the book jacket or is the book too small to contain it and that open question is one that kind of drives um, the book and also again hangs over a lot of the work that i've been doing and the central question um, throughout that that kind of conundrum too big or too small is this even richer question which is who is the world designed for next slide um, and how do we know so a lot of people, I think, um, not in this crowd, but um, in the world at large, think of uh, design and disability often in two ways. Next slide. One is uh, exemplified in this image, the very high-end, um, high-tech realm of prosthetics. So this is a, a man with two uh, hands resting on a table, one of which is a flesh arm and hand, and one of which is the kind of um, high-end, myoelectric, very uh, sophisticated biomimicry of a replacement prosthetic, um, quite expensive, um, the product of high-tech engineering labs. And the story, the, the powerful charismatic story of persuasion about replacement that's happening here that we see also because the, that robotic hand on the left is, is outfitted with a wedding ring, a kind of identity marker and the restoration that's kind of promised there. So there's a reason why that feels like a very powerful, overwhelmingly powerful story about what is design and disability. Well, it's high tech prosthetics. And that's certainly one story. Next slide. Um, the other story people tend to think about is what's, uh, of course, in this crowd, you know, universal design. And so I'm showing images here of the Cuisinart food processor the Aeron chair and the OXO Good Grips kitchen tools all in a row. Those are um, classical uh, design product kind of industry stories 
with a universal design logic behind them. So if we look to the condition of disability, uh, a condition kind of on the margins of user experience, we find this insight that then informs products that, that go on to enhance um, all kinds of people's lives in their uh, tailored ergonomics, for example, or their, you know, the, the kind of ease of use. And so those tend to be the two dominant stories and they're interesting ones, prosthetics and uh, universal design. Next slide. But in fact, uh, as many of you know, the way the body meets the world, um, and especially where the, the physical, social, and political condition of disability meets the world, is actually a story that has infinite variety in it. And I wanted to try to capture that in the book to get people uh, one level down from those kind of popular journalistic stories. Next slide. So um, the book is ordered in chapters of where design meets disability at multiple scales. So it's organized um, in chapters that start with a chapter called Limb, which is about prosthetic parts, high tech, low tech, wearables, people opting in, people opting out, uh, very expensive, very low cost, but all the ways to think about that, the things that we wear. And then it goes out one scale from the body to a chapter called chair, which is about household products. It goes out to a chapter after that to room. So extending the scale to our, our the interior surroundings of our lives and then extends one scale out from that to a chapter called street about cities and urban planning. And then finally to a chapter called clock, which is not a literal object, but a conceptual object about the design of time and about the way disability uh, shapes time and about what disabled people and scholars have called crip time. So um, that is a way I, I tried to structure it that way uh, to try to show all the places where a disability shows up. It's not just in the physical or in the sensory or mobility space. It has a lot to do with all kinds of bodily uh, uh, functions, but also that design is really everywhere. And I wanted for folks who think of design as a specialist enterprise to see again that actually it's in all the all the features and the shapes of all the built stuff that's in our very everyday, often beneath our notice. It's so everyday. So I want to just um, talk to you, if I can, about a couple of the themes that are running through <clears throat> the the book and tell a couple of the stories that are there. Next slide. <clears throat> it starts um, in the first chapter with a, a, a concept that many of you may be familiar with, that is Rosemarie Garland Thompson's idea of misfitting. As Rosemarie Garland Thompson, in a in a quite formative and important paper um, about this concept of misfits takes that what is a commonplace word and gives us the kind of social model of disability that's actually packed within it. She says that misfitting, the condition of disability as misfitting implies that there is a kind of condition of being a square peg in a round hole world. So to say that again, seems maybe commonplace and, and self-evident, except that what she unpacks there is to say that to be a square peg in a round hole world means that the, where the mismatch is happening, it's not actually clear whether it's at the site of the body, a body whose shapes or, or capacities is non-normative, or whether the world, the, the shape of that round hole is where the onus lies, where the mismatch and the, the, the the sort of locus of the problem may be, so if it's framed as a problem. So the, the, the misfit is actually running both ways. So I'm just pointing my finger out and then back to the body, out and then back to the body, that gives us a way to conceptualize that social model of disability, right? That disability is never purely about the medical conditions of the body and its biology and capacities. It includes those things, but that the, the aperture can be wider when we take a social model of disability and say, right, what you all know, that the interaction between the body and this desk, the body and the chair, is that condition of misfitting. And if the square peg and round hole conundrum is the real condition, then the question for designers and technologists is always, is it that the body is the locus of where we might intervene and bring its capacities to the normative shapes of the world? Or is some feature of the built world 
the, the site where we'd actually want to intervene and walk its features back toward the body. It's not clear which of those is called for and it takes all our attention and discipline to say, where is it? Where shall we work? What are the right questions? Where shall we begin? And so on. So that is a, in the introduction, I try to give a kind of, um, you know, a, a sort of loop together um, translation of a number of disabled scholars, such as Rosemary and Simi Linton and a number of other folks, telling us some of those big basics about uh, the social model of disability and how misfitting then sets us up for thinking about design. Next slide. So then in the limb chapter, um, we drop in on a number of uh, folks. Uh, and in this book, I'm sort of journalist in this way, sort of profiling people with scenes in their environments. And we drop in on um, a man like this named Chris, who's a 30 something white man standing here in this image. And Chris uh, has uh, a normative flesh arm and hand on the left and on the right, he has a residual limb that tapers off just beneath his shoulder. And we're at the changing table with his young infant here in this scene. And Chris has got um, a, a holster hanging uh, made of soft, uh, cords and felted wool, a holster that is hanging from that residual limb and is suspending the little ankles of his baby who's getting a diaper change. And Chris is uh, you know, a, a person who, because he was born with one arm, became uh, the subject of a lot of design and engineering. Lots of folks interested in building for Chris a, a prosthesis replacement arm and hand. But for Chris, not for everybody, but for Chris, um, that uh, a prosthesis uh, has never been actually, certainly not a universal prosthesis like the one I showed you earlier, that has never been uh, an object that's actually useful for him. And I tell a little bit of the story about his growing up and about his parents wrestling with the decision as when he was a young child and then later his own kind of negotiations, trying to figure out whether to opt in or opt out and all of those questions were partly functional and they were partly cultural about what it means to look more normative and to think about replacing that part. And we drop in on him here because he did find in adulthood, there are some situations where just the right prosthesis calibrated in just the right way at just the right time um, is a kind of uh, tinkering exercise that he himself has taken up. And like many disabled people throughout history, he has been adapting his world to himself and himself to the world in all kinds of ways. And the chapter called Lynn um, drops in on Chris um, you know, as well as a number of other people in this vast history of the use of prosthetic limbs. And it's never just one story. So Chris is opting in, in a way, to this bespoke $10 prosthesis. Next slide. But, and I'm showing you uh, an image of a man on the left who we also meet uh, named Mike, who uh, himself became an amputee as a teenager and now has worn generations of prosthetic limbs. And he does wear that uh, super high-end myoelectric limb on uh, there that you're seeing on the left, on his left side. So Chris on the one hand and Mike on the other, not to say that one is better or worse, that low tech is better than high tech or vice versa, but just to say the world is full of all kinds of adaptations. Train your eyes instead on the wonder of the adaptive human body. And that's where the real story lies, that the technology is should always point us back to the miraculous thing that is this sensing adaptive set, set of organs in any of its forms. So we look at the way this myoelectric arm um, is indicative of the history of what's called rehabilitation engineering, which is a post-World War I and World War II, especially phenomenon in the United States of research dollars and priorities being uh, shunted towards the, the research and development of replacement parts and the way that the war machine creates the, the need and the necessity for those things. And then it really tries to richly complicate, again, all our ideas about what counts as technology and who makes it and who gets it and at what cost and so on. So on the right in this image, I'm showing you um, an image from uh, one clinic in the Jaipur Foot Organization, that's J-A-I-P-U-R. In India, there are uh, a number of clinics all over India um, that are instantiations of the Jaipur Foot Organization. And that organization has designed, manufactured, and distributed 
uh, low tech, lower tech, um, lower limb prostheses for the last many decades and distributed them for free over a million and a half now, must be near 2 million now. Um, and the, the, the deep, you know, the, um, the, the profound impact uh, and the ingeniousness of that design. And we go in the book to India. I, I went there in a teaching capacity and was able to tour one of the clinical sites um, and, and to see that process, how it happens and who it serves, and to think about the economic model of impact that it means to create a prosthesis like this, when so much, uh, certainly in countries like the United States, so much of the press about what counts as technology is this very fancy engineering produced high-tech arm. And I wanted to say in this chapter that it's adaptation, adaptation everywhere. That's the much more interesting story. Next slide. We also in that chapter talk about the way that opting out of prosthetics um, is just as interesting a story as opting in. And I'm showing you an image of the great poet and essayist Audre Lorde. Um, who wrote profoundly uh, in a number of books about race and sexuality, um, but also wrote the cancer journals in which she details um, living through um, uh, uh, experiences of breast cancer, including um, you know, having a mastectomy on one side and tangling at the doctor's office in the wake of that recovery over her choice not to wear the replacement breast prosthesis that's offered to her. And the tangle, you know, the conflict there was about the morale at the office, at the doctor's office, that is boosted by other people wearing those prosthetics and appearing to be whole and the, the replacement parts that are, that are on offer there. And none of that is to say, plenty of you know plenty of people who make different kinds of choices um, about mastectomies, about replacement parts. There's no right or wrong choice here. The question more is to the reader, when we read about Audre Lorde, we meet Chris at the changing table, we look at Mike's fancy arm, we go to India, is just to rearrange in our own minds, what, what will our choices be when and if our bodies change? And what are the resources for that adaptation that we would marshal when the story would become our own? And have we thought through um, all the wisdom that we'd wanna access um, in that moment? Next slide. Not only that, but that every time the body meets the world, it is not just a question of functionality and high tech or low tech, but that the body meets the world in biopolitical ways. And so we see that profoundly in Lord's case and elsewhere too. Next slide. Um, here again, there's Chris um, on the right uh, um, and he kind of bookends this chapter with a woman um, on the left who I'm showing you a portrait of Cindy, who's um, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, about a 65 year old woman who became a quadruple amputee um, at age 60 and um, woke up in a new body after an extended coma um, and had to figure out how to adapt to her life. Cindy qualified for one of those very high-tech arms and in fact has one, but it sits in a closet um, in her house and in its place, the replacement parts that she has assembled is a whole family of low-tech objects that really make her life work. So we're looking at Cindy who, as you can see, has um, very few, uh, uh, sections of digits on both hands. It said most of the digits have been removed on both her hands. So she needs some grasping um, supports, grasping and carrying supports. And one of the things that she's using is some rubber tubing uh, covering an eyeliner to put on eyeliner. And then you're looking at um, on the bottom, um, a little silicone cap that fits over her residual limb on the right side in the absence of a hand or fingers. That silicone cap which is lodged with a ballpoint pen. This again came to her after that fancy arm, but she went to her prosthetist and said, what I really wanna do is write a note again, write a thank you note, um, can you help me do that? And for again, for, for a few dollars, this you know pen and cap is the kind of replacement parts that for her, replace the things that matter. You know, Cindy as a quadruple amputee in 2020, doesn't actually need to ever write again. I mean, speech to text in a smartphone is really quite good in its fidelity, but she wanted to. That was the replacement that mattered to her. And to me, that story is endlessly uh, compelling because it proceeds not just from her prescribed needs, but from her wishes. 
and the way that a low cost uh, um, object can actually do a whole lot of work. Next slide. So replacement parts for the things that matter in a frame of adaptation. Next slide. Here's Cindy just writing on um, in her own handwriting, uh, her recognizable handwriting. That's a tool she uses every day. This is just her two hands and a legal pad showing her writing cursive. Next slide. So in the chair chapter, um, a little more briefly, there's this question, That's this is where we kind of tackle the question of universal design, which is this, this kind of question here. Do we design all things for one in that kind of like Cindy's pen holder? Or do we sometimes also make one widget object that scales and, and meets all? And that's of course the logic of universal design. Next slide. And in this chapter, I try to contrast um, a couple of stories you're looking at in the left two images at um, uh, uh, cardboard carpentry chairs. So a radically bespoke and customized practice of building um, chairs and furniture and foot supports and um, tablet holders and all kinds of furniture out of what's called triple wall cardboard. So three layers of fluted cardboard piece together. And when you stack that, those, the, what are called the flutes, that little curly part of the cardboard, when you stack that up and down, it functions like rebar in a building. It's quite structurally sound. So in this image on the far left, we're in the, um, the workshop of the Adaptive Design Association. Um, and you can see there are a couple of fabricators um, with a toddler who's seated in a cardboard chair on, a, on top of a, a workshop um, table and they are fitting him for that chair down to the quarter of an inch. They are measuring just what he needs in terms of trunk support and proper mobility and so on. And uh, a physical therapist of his looks on and his parents are somewhere out of the frame. And we meet this young man who is pseudonymized as Nico and he's sitting there in the finished chair in the middle. So it's a cardboard chair and uh, a detachable tray and a desk uh, attachment as well, painted into bright shades of blue and sealed up um, with tape and varnish and so on. So it's just the right chair at just the right time. This is this all this effort for one. And it's contrasted then with that universal design story um, on the right, which is exemplified by the Aeron chair that probably many of you have familiarity with that proceeds from that universal design logic. So the Aeron chair began uh, you know, with a, the condition of aging and design for aging. And it now has become this kind of status symbol chair all over the fancy offices of Silicon Valley and so on. But the question there um, uh, that's really interesting to me is, Yes, universal design gives us plenty of really good objects, especially when they're like the OXO good grips tools that are a more ergonomic vegetable peeler. And we want those, you know, especially at the $10 and under, we want those at the big box store. We want that universal design. But what happens too when, when the inverse is also true, that we organize a whole way of working in the way of the Adaptive Design Association around one person at a time. And what's interesting about the Adaptive Design Association is that they share richly. Next slide. I'm showing you another image of a, of a couple of children being designed for just supports, little stander supports for the act of play between young children. The social way that parents, teachers, therapists, any number, educators, any number of people enter into this workshop and say, what is the right, what is the exact right uh, piece of furniture, piece of, you know, kind of architecture, um, somewhere between architecture and a product that would help this child for this six months um, that's not available on the market, you know, what would we get from that? And it's not just that it's a boutique practice. Next slide. Um, the Adaptive Design Association, I'm showing you a screenshot of all of the YouTube uh, learning library videos. They share how it is that they build this stuff with anybody who wants to know. So they bring people to their workshop, they present all over the world, um, short clinics, but they build their materials also, they build their furniture 
out of uh, red readily available and affordable materials. So cardboard, you can even make triple wall cardboard if you glue three sheets together. But they also, they use a lot of, they use wooden dowels and Elmer's glue and, you know, very rudimentary band saws and things that are available to a lot of people. So in this way, I'm not just trying to contrast all for one and one for all, but I'm trying to, to um, offer a kind of way of working as a scalable, so a rep replicable uh, mode of working in design. So in this case, um, I call on the design theorist Ezio Manzini, so it's M-A-N-Z-I-N-I, -I, and he talks about diffuse design. So design that isn't um, one widget that's, you know, manufactured in a factory at 10,000, 100,000, or a million, but instead a localized practice like this that is shareable via networks, online, um, shared practices, and so on. And I'm just trying to help the reader think through, like, what is our metric for design that's really meaningful? Does it always have to be one little object that Marat, the killer app, you know, that goes out to two million people? Or can we rearrange our metrics for thinking about what matters and think about these ingenious kind of networked sharing processes for um, highly bespoke objects like this one? Next slide. Um, and then moving on to the room chapter, the question that's running through here is this, what does it mean to dwell? And could we rethink independence in the rooms um, and houses of our lives? Um, Next slide. We drop in on um, what I'm showing you here, the, uh, the lobby uh, of, a, of a, a combination dorm and workspace at Gallaudet University. Um, that, that is organized around a new building that is organized around principles of what's called deaf space. So architecture for deafness. Um, and at Gallaudet, right, uh, students are doing what students at colleges do everywhere, which is trying to make sense of who they're becoming, who they were in the past with their family and who they might want to be in the future. And so they are dwelling in, at college in the way that is uh, standard and commonplace, but they are also then making a choice to come to Gallaudet and think about dwelling in a quite rich sense um, with a deaf community, with a proud signing community. And deaf space, Gallaudet, um, I should say, which was chartered in 1864 by Abraham Lincoln, has always carried with it adaptive features of architectural uh, use of space that deaf folks have been doing for forever. So um, the light switches that are outside of the offices of faculty and staff that you turn off and on, right, to, to instead of knocking, or a somatic doorbell that was built into one of the old um, buildings on campus. So um, deaf education has been around a long time. Deaf adaptation to architecture has been around a long time, but deaf space was a kind of way of formalizing a bunch of folks from Gallaudet coming together and saying, what is it that we're always doing in space? And then what would an architecture look like that makes that stuff visible? So you know, it's certainly not nothing like that kind of prosthetic replacement part of fixing hearing, right, or the, the absence of hearing. It's something else entirely, which is to say, oftentimes architects talk about buildings as an envelope. What is the envelope around um, deaf, deaf speech, deaf sociality? And what would it look like, you know, to build it into a building? So what you're seeing here um, are features that you might associate with other modern buildings um, that may be familiar to you. That is a polished concrete floor, um, rafters and bright light um, at the top, a warm and organic solid color. So there's a kind of medium teal and blue and green uh, upholstery and wall color. And these kind of open plan, long sight lines, we're seeing a number of people signing to one another, walking and sitting of uh, various races um, in this lobby. But there are really ingenious things happening here. So the, um, the color schemes, those solid colors are meant to be maximally um, provide good contrast for a number of skin tones who are um, using sign. And the uh, threshold widths are meant to preserve the conversation 
communication that's happening between two people who are looking at one another um, as they proceed through that threshold. And the use of these half height walls that you see here create long sight lines through that room at short, medium, and long range, rather than dividing the room into workspaces with walls that block sound, right? Because you don't need that so much. Um, and there just are all kinds of features of deaf space that are uh, that are so interesting to think about. And it just turns on its head the natural idea of what architecture does, which is that it's supposed to, you know, yield this, you know, monument, this like charismatic building, finished building. But deaf space is really about a process of design that's much more interesting even than the materiality itself. We also in the book go down to the signing Starbucks on H Street in nearby Gallaudet um, that is staffed entirely by deaf folks behind the counter and the very simple actually service design, we'd call it in, in my field, the service design changes that make that Starbucks serviceable to hearing folks and to deaf folks with just a wipe away tablet and some very, not very fancy technologies. And the way that that shifts the power dynamics of that uh, commercial space. Um, if we get into in this chapter, so Gallaudet kind of opens it and then we get into the, in this chapter into an idea that carries through the rest of the book which is um, a term that environmental psychologists use about how rooms uh, and buildings in our lives are can be thought of as action settings. Next slide. So um, Sarah Williams Goldhagen uh, introduced me to this idea that action settings are the way that, you know, if you go into a cafeteria versus a cathedral, you know immediately the differences and the ways that you are expected to behave there, the kinds of belonging that is that are that are broadcast by those spaces, partly about their heights and their materials and the arrangement of their furniture, partly about their, you know, somatic qualities and the sounds and the sights partly about the patterns of behavior that you can observe among others, that all of that is an almost precognitive communication that's happening that's telling us what's the action setting that's here. And um, it's most interesting to me to think about the places where disability and design meet that, that, that um, alter our sense of what the action is, who can be there, what what kinds of norms are set and reset and so on to me that that's where these this idea comes alive and we look at action settings in a couple of other places next slide i'm showing you on the left an image a black and white image of ed roberts who um, folks will know was a polio survivor um, and used a chair and a lot of um, extensive medical equipment for his life and made an adaptive life for himself on uh, among other disabled people on the UC Berkeley campus and became one of the most important civil rights leaders uh, in our country's history. He's in this image on the Berkeley campus and standing next to him is a black man uh, who's using a service animal for navigation. And they're kind of indicative of the um, disability activism that was born on the Berkeley campus, um, in part uh, thanks to design. So some people uh, may know that, that Roberts, when he was accepted to Berkeley's campus, um, it wasn't obvious where he was going to live. And it worked out that he lived, took up residence in the hospital on campus at Berkeley and was joined there then by a number of other students with medical needs who lived on you know, a hospital ward that became, with adaptive reuse, a dormitory, a dormitory of their own design. And uh, to me, that it's such a fascinating way that one space in its normative use became reused in another way, which launched in important ways an idea because Roberts and others didn't have to just live on campus and manage a new life as a college student the way students do. But in addition to doing classes and so on, they also needed to hire and manage personal attendance. They needed to think about the ways that their bodies were meeting this world and the ways that they were gonna arrange a life with care in it. And so long story short, again, many of you know that um, what was the way that the hospital became a dorm was the seed of an idea that helped found the first Center for Independent Living in Berkeley and then became what became the independent living movement, um, which is still with us today in the form of brick and mortar centers that help people uh, outfit their homes and also do that kind of employment work. And what's interesting about 
independent living is that for these folks, um, Judy Human and, and lots of others um, at that time, they were they were reframing independence themselves by saying that independence is not about the clinical idea of self-sufficiency, but instead about agency, that independence should be framed around an idea of self-determination, they said. And so a rich, independent life, they claimed, could actually include a whole ecosystem of care, some of it adaptive and technological and designed, some of it with the human care of caregiving, and how that helps all of us to rethink what we imagine independence to be or do, and whether that kind of the independence that we may carry around as an assumption is in fact the key to the, the life that we want, can help also be part of a desirable life. So I carry kind of that through to um, this end story in the room chapter, which is about Steve Sailing on the right, who, as you see, is a middle-aged man in a motorized wheelchair with a wheelchair-mounted tablet uh, computer system in a residential room where he lives um, uh, 14 years into a diagnosis of ALS. And as you see, there's nothing clinical about this room. It's got rich red walls and artwork and plants and textiles um, as in a home. Steve got a diagnosis of ALS and because he was trained as a landscape architect, understood that design could be part of the way that he rebuilt his life, um, knowing the changes that were gonna come to his body. And so Steve now uh, lives in the, the sailing residence here in Boston, um, which is the, uh, a big floor of a nursing home that is um, a rich ecosystem of automation and care. So on that wheelchair mounted tablet ta that's talking to a cursor that's mounted on the bridge of his eyeglasses, he can uh, call all the elevators and open all the doors and run his media and HVAC and so on. And this is in the era before smart home technologies kind of came to the big box stores. So this was a, a work of working with philanthropists and software engineers and architects to make this happen. So he lives there today alongside other people with ALS and with MS. And this helps us actually to, um, to think really carefully about um, not just independence as self-determination, not just interdependence, perhaps we'd say, but what Eva Fetter Kitte, K-I-T-T-A-Y, the philosopher says that is our real dependence actually on one another. And so there's a meditation here on the end on whether in fact we reframe just independence or whether we might actually call the plain fact of dependence, um, even in acute cases uh, like Steve's, as part of a, a, a life that might be built. And I think Steve, you know, occupies a certain kind of disability territory wherein he would tomorrow rejoice in a medical cure for his condition. And, and it is also the case that a life worth living might be built. And the profound uh, wisdom in that, uh, I, I think about still all the time and, and Steve's at the center of it. Next slide. And finally, um, this chapter called Clock is about uh, the notion of crip time in disability studies. And I won't tell you uh, a huge amount about it, but just to say this gets beyond um, physical getting around. Um, Next slide. I'm showing you an image here of the main kind of feature um, that, that is profiled here of a, of a like a volunteer working core of adults with developmental or physical and sometimes both disabilities that's here in Boston called EPIC. EPIC, and um, we're looking at a bunch of uh, young people, some of whom use chairs, uh, various races, and they're out in a field doing some of their volunteer work. It's a group shot. Um, and EPIC is, um, again, what we'd call service design, because I wanted to look at crip time and developmental disability. So I am also the parent um, of a 14 year old with Down syndrome and uh, have a number of uh, folks on the autism spectrum in my immediate family. Um, and so I think a lot about where the design of prosthetics and replacement parts and products really falls away. And what is the design of the future with a life on crip time in it? And we can talk about this in the Q and A if you like. Um, but it's about kind of the future that's being built by young people like this. And EPIC is a, it's like a city year, but for young people with disabilities where they do community service in the form of 
urban agriculture, they clean up parks, they do all of that kind of work. And then they do mock interviews and they um, learn about disability history and they practice taking the subway and the buses. And so they do a lot of kind of prepping for adulthood, get a line on a resume, do a lot of community service. And what's so what shouldn't be astonishing, but is, is that they are on the giving end of this service design, not on the receiving end. And they are in public rebuilding um, public space. Um, so it's quite something to think about um, crypt time and where design might live. Next slide. So that is kind of what can a body do, um, you know, in, in the scope of the book and, and me as a journalist. Next slide. I just want to turn briefly to this question. What can design and design writing do? Um, just to say, you know, at large in my role as a professor, but also writing books, right, that uh, we hope that that, you know, in some way um, leads to a kind of education that is a piece of what I do, is a piece of what a lot of us do who work in access. And again, Danielle Allen, the political philosopher, says, what is education for? Next slide. Just to back way up. She says, it's for participatory readiness participatory readiness or civic agency. So in other words, that education is not just about what you would call professional readiness, not just about training for a job in a field, but this citizenship work, this civic agency that makes us ready to participate in a democracy in the modern world. And what does she say is the are the ingredients of this? Well, there are a couple things about democratic um, deliberation and so on. But one of the things she says that civic agency requires next slide is that we 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 are on the receiving end of she would call it prophetic reframing so she would say for example that when dr king is talking about i've been to the mountaintop or i have a dream that's more than beautiful oratory that is reframing, redescribing the world as it is with other language so that we see it differently and then we act differently as a result. So when Jane Jacobs says that the sidewalk is the ballet of public life, we see the city differently. When Rachel Carson says that the, the, the birds and their eating of the pesticides tied to the crops is an entire system of environment. We see that system now. We see our natural world differently, that the reframing has a kind of prophetic, um, in, those, in those lauded cases, has a kind of, does a prophetic work of telling us about the world differently so that we'll see each other differently. And then again, that we'll act differently as citizens, um, civic actors accordingly. Um, so, you know, she would say, right, where does this live in rhetoric and communications? Next slide. That the way we speak to one another, those, that oratory, those speeches, sometimes in books, that they do this frame shifting work and they move us conceptually to a different way of seeing one another. And I think all of us would agree that disability is so beset by the frame of sentimentality, the frame of inspiration, the frame of medical tragedy, and that we need all kinds of frame shifting to help lots of audiences in lots of different languages with lots of different ends to see disability as a deeply human experience with a particular politics and yet with wisdom for all of us, that we see the technologies giving us assistance in our lives. So many of that, so much of that frame shifting work is I think needed in the way we speak about and, um, and incorporate disability into our lives and our politics. And the thing that I've also been trying to do is ask whether you could do reframing in the studio. Next slide. In the stuff that we actually build um, and whether yes, uh, words can do that, but whether practices can also do that. So I will just end by saying, uh, you know, we drop in, uh, you know, in the book on uh, my collaboration with Amanda Kasha, who I'm showing you here. Next slide. Amanda uh, is a curator and an art historian and also has a form of dwarfism and came to me to collaborate with her on a, um, 
uh, a lectern for short stature that is collapsible and portable. So I'm just showing you images of that cardboard prototype and also the fold out model in one, two, three steps of that lectern for short stature to try to reframe um, Amanda's condition of misfitting in the world that she wanted a different world, a different piece of architecture and to reframe what a prosthesis should do. And um, I also uh, worked with um, wheelchair dancer Alice Shepard on a big ramped environment that she wanted, not for getting into a building, but for stage. Next slide. So I'm just showing you the big under construction um, room scale ramp that looks like an oceanic wave being built on campus um, at Olin with students. Next slide. And here's Alice and her partner, Laurel, two women in wheelchairs uh, dancing on a giant room scale uh, uh, wave of a ramp and everything that that did in the studio to reframe disability. Next slide. And here's a kind of performance image of Alice and Laurel in full color um, of, of their uh, now fully realized ramped environment that my students helped to design and build. Um, Next slide. We also worked with Carmen Papalia, who you see here, who is a 30 something um, uh, man who, Italian American man who, Italian Canadian, sorry, fan, uh, man who um, came to Olin. Um, he's also blind and uses a navigational cane and wanted us to help him turn that cane into a sonic instrument. And here we are prototyping in the studio with lots of, um, you know, ready to hand materials to think about how we might build what resulted. And that's in two images here. Next slide a cane that has a contact mic um, printed, 3D printed into its end and a kind of boom box for amplifying. And, and this cane actually, instead of um, doing navigation, what he wanted was a cane to play the built environment, to read those textures and to translate them into sound. Um, and so I'm showing you on the left, he is using it on a city street to kind of scrape the sidewalk with that boom box worn at his hip to play the built environment in that way. Next slide. So in all that work, I am trying to do this reframing of rehab engineering to reframe what a prosthesis can be and do and who asks for it and why, right? That, that, that is for me, I don't think it's prophetic in the way of Dr. King or any of those greats, but in my little R way, just trying to do a little reframing with rehab and, of rehab engineering. Next slide. And that I'm thinking all the time about what I'm designing for, what I'm designing against, what I'm writing for, and what I'm writing against. And next slide. So just to revisit Mike um, on the left with that arm and the Jai Per Foot organization, I'm trying to reframe what counts as innovation in that limb chapter. Next slide. Just to revisit this image from the Adaptive Design Association and Cardboard Carpentry. Here I'm trying to reframe expertise and that idea of scale. Next slide. Um, and here to revisit the room chapter with Ed Roberts and Steve Sailing. Here I'm trying to reframe um, independence. Next slide. So when we say reframing, we often think, oh, we want to look at things with new eyes. Next slide. But I think that Danielle Allen is saying reframing is actually understanding some really deep stuff. We're reframing who our audiences are, what vernacular do we use? What is our operative and working theory of change, right? For a more accessible world. What are we designing for and designing against? What is our relationship to contemporary conditions and the timeliness of those versus their histories? The slides close and Sarah's video returns to full screen. So thank you so much. That That is what I'm gonna share. Um, and I'd be happy to um, talk now with folks about whatever questions may have come up in terms of topics or in terms of process. During the Q&A, the current speaker's video is in full screen. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really fascinating. I really enjoyed reading the book and then hearing you speak to all of those subjects and also getting to see more images of all these people whose stories you tell is really fantastic. Um, so we've gotten a couple of questions in and I will also be kind of selfish and just ask some of the questions that I personally have. Um, but just to start off, something that I was thinking about as I was reading it 
was your author's note at the beginning of the book was written in May of 2020. And you talk a little bit about the pandemic. Of course, where we were in May is very different from where we are in December. So I'm just curious with the book kind of going to print at the very beginning of all of this, how has this year, how has 2020 maybe changed your thinking on these subjects or evolved your thinking? Um, I'm thinking especially about the, the systems and networks that you talk about since we're all so alone or can feel like we're all so alone right now. Yeah. Yeah, we struggled with the decision of whether to address it because we knew things were going to change every month. And so we thought, well, if if we're all wrong about this, you know, it'll we can take it out at paperback time or whatever. Like it was a really weird kind of decision to make. And yet here it was so related to, to what it is that we were suddenly faced with, and it felt wrong not to address it. So it appears in a couple of places in the book, very last minute. Um, I certainly think that we have watched um, a story, an old story play out, continue to play out, which is that disabled people have been way out in front on a lot of um, wisdom for adaptation that a lot of other non-disabled people have, are confronting for the first time. So, you know, disabled people have been asking for things like telehealth to be much more robust and common. And I think there's just been a lot of inertia among the medical community for offering that because folks, you know, didn't have enough of a push to get over the hump of figuring out this, the technological interface. And now of course we have it and people have been asking again for that for a long time. So there has been something bittersweet that I've been hearing from my friends uh, who've been wanting that for a while or work from home policies. Um, it has been really interesting to see the shape of our worlds change quite quickly in the face of what I always find is more true, which is that folks are often, um, uh, non-disabled folks in particular, are often uh, skeptical of change because of just the sheer force of the way things have always been, you know, and I, it has been interesting to watch suddenly you can have plexiglass around all of the cashiers. Like suddenly you can, you know, customize the sticker for where you stand six feet apart. That, And so there has been something really galvanizing about watching the shape shifting that can happen when there is political will around it. So now the question becomes, what are the things that we would want to hang on to? And what are the things that we are, hope will we'll go back to a, another way of being? But that we should see the built world as under more under construction potentially more at the time than we realize, right? That, that it looks quite fixed and permanent in a lot of its normative states. And this year has shown us, no, no, it is really possible in low tech ways and high tech ways under duress and in quick form and in slow gradations to change the way the world works. And disabled people again, have known this for a long time. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, that concept of evolving and our streetscapes seem so fixed and certain and yet, when they have to, we're able to completely change the world around us. That's right. It's and that's the history of, of curb cuts, right? I mean, people, yeah. disabled people and folks in the access community aren't surprised by this anymore, but I still talk to people all the time who think, oh, oh, that's right. Oh, 25 years ago, that was not, you know, like th this idea that you would reshape the entirety at infrastructural scale, that you would reshape cities. Uh, it can be done, it has been done quite recently. And I will just point that out to all of our folks who are working in nonprofits that may be struggling and have fewer staff than they had in March of last year, that some of this stuff that you want to do at your organization that may seem impossible, we're at a moment of change and inflection. So it, this may be the perfect point where the impossible is possible. Um, thank you. We did get a question about the concept of crip time, if that was something that you could elaborate a little bit more on and speak a bit more to, to that whole concept. Yeah, for sure. And I reference um, Allison Kafer, it's K-A-F-E-R, and um, Ellen Samuels, both scholars who write beautifully about crip time and reference Douglas Bainton and a number of other scholars um, uh, who've named this for us and, and have books that are much deeper on the topic. Um, but crip time, um, you know, the, the way uh, I've heard people use it in casual speech can be like, you know, this bathroom is not accessible and I'm, I'm on crip time trying to, you know, get in and out of this, you know, the, the far end bathroom because the way this building is built and the kind of 
recognition and eye roll about like I am I'm on crypt time, you know, because of the way my body meets the world. And that's a kind of casual use. But really, uh, there's a much deeper bite in crypt time, which is about the way that disabled people have in being misfits for the normative functions of the world, not just the, the, the built space of the world, but also, especially in developmental disability, but not only that, in the normative time structures of how fast do you go through a K-12 education and on what clip do you do so? And what kinds of proficiencies do you need to have at the end of that time frame that's acceptable for then you to go on to college that becomes acceptable for then you to take on the 40 hour work week because that's what everybody does. And that's the way that the economic time of the world organizes all our lives. So disabled people have said for a long time that crypt time is a rebuke to that, to the, the rigid normativity of economic and industrial time. And this is nowhere more acute than in the condition, for example, uh, of my son, Graham, who has Down syndrome or other kinds of developmental disabilities where the misfit is not about the sensory or mobility capacity so much, I mean, a little bit, but it's mostly the crip time of being a misfit uh, in that you can't become an economic subject you can't become the acceptable, uh, you know, the sort of high functioning and efficient uh, economic unit that a lot of education and job structures are set up to be. And that crypt time therefore, um, you know, Kafer says, crypt time is flex time, not just expanded, but exploded, right? It is this idea that, that what does it mean for bodies, for people to, to enter the world, to live lives worth living with dignity and worth about them that don't conform to those structures. And so I get into a little bit of the history of time and clocks and industrial time and daylight saving. And like all of that is, that is all industry. That is all industry mapped clocks on our lives to make us into efficient subjects. Now, you know, we can be glad about, uh, about industrial time and the efficiencies that it affords a globalized culture, but do we want the clock mapped onto all of the features of our lives? And do we want actually a time outside of that economic clock? So crypt time is one of the most, I think, powerful uh, subversive ideas in disability studies that there is. And how would we design for it? You know? Yeah, that was something that really struck me as well, kind of questioning the very structure of our economies and our societies and how is that, um, how does that match with letting all people live a fulfilling life within those structures and, you know, do we have to start breaking some of those structures down or changing them fundamentally in order for that to happen? It's, it's really thought provoking. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it has been super nourishing for me and to, and to be raising a child who I'm asking all the time, right? Uh, who's in partial inclusion, you know, like what is it that he, who is it that he wants to be, you know? And even the ways that special education can be quite normalizing in its kind of assumptions about what will make his life worth living. And I'm just trying to pay really close attention to like, what is it that, what is it that Graham is telling us that he wants to do? And where is it that he finds that worth? And some of it will be in some of those normalizing patterns and some of it will be a, a welcome deviation from the norm. Awesome. Um, one of the things that somebody has commented on, hold on, I'm trying to find my, my notes here. Um, you have a lot of talk, especially in the LIM chapter, about uh, technology and kind of the spectrum of technology. And you talked about it a bit today as well. You have the, at one end, the hyper realistic, trying to mimic all of the subtleties of a human hand precisely hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars going into very high tech solutions. And on the other hand, you have like the Jag per foot organization that's fitting very low tech, but very um, effective prostheses on people at scale. Um, and I know a lot of our attendees in a lot of ways are looking at, uh, or have organizations that are looking at the next shiny thing out there on the horizon for access where really what the top priority should be is, can we please for the love of God install a wheelchair ramp to the front door so that people don't have to go around to the back door. Like, what would your advice be to somebody who's trying to make the case for a lower tech solution that would really benefit more people when those in power, those who control the budget maybe, 
are really mesmerized by the technology and yeah. all the things that it can legitimately do, but um, it has its limits. Yeah, I mean, I think so. A couple things um, in that limb chapter, I uh, refer to the historian David Edgerton. So it's E D G E R T O N, and he talks about how we should take a um, a, a frame of technology in use um, that actually is a wider lens for thinking about the impact of technology rather than where we normally locate it, which is at the site, the moment of innovation or invention. So newness for its own sake. So that if we look at technology in use, then we look at, you know, not so much just at space flight, um, you know, in the 20th century, but we would look at um, a technology like the bicycle or the rickshaw. We would look at these technologies that by their sheer ubiquity, by their, their global reach, by their um, eminently fixable kind of elemental parts and by what they made possible, then, then we would see, okay, the use metric is actually more appropriate than the newness that replaced the old possibility in a mechanical sense or in a digital sense. So I do think that's a helpful frame. And he has a whole book on this um, called Shock of the Old, right, as opposed to Shock of the New. Um, but I also think that uh, you know, here again, diffuse design or, um, I mean, people used to talk about appropriate technology, um, but uh, for a lot of reasons, people have left that frame behind. Um, and I think, you know, there are lots of ways to think about uh, what boils down to what is the closest um, quality of attention we can bring to our particular situation, right? So like this question about whether it's the ramp or um, some a very fancy, you know, kind of technology. What, how can we run, like, uh, it doesn't even have to be that expensive or that um, lengthy, but how can we run a closely attending human-centered design process about what it is that our organization or our environment is asking for and how, what, how, what are the next moves that we would make um, to do that? And I have to say again, you know, it's not like, I mean, I'm watching my son use autocomplete you know, like language processing, AI powered email right now. And I'm like, that's unbelievable. It's also, it's in Google. And so we're trading privacy for convenience. And I object to that economic model for a lot of reasons. But so the high tech, we do want plenty of that. My, a lot of my disabled friends would say this iPhone is a liberatory object, right? So it's not an anti-technology kind of argument. It's just that Anytime the technology is sort of like wowing us with its features and we're not redirected back to this, this adaptive site, this human body, and also the technologies that actually link us back to each other, not the ones that just take us away, but link us back to each other. And here again, that's that reframed independence. Like what is, what is the thing that actually builds a richer life? Um, that's where the questions get more interesting. You know, so it's like, don't ask the what and the how about the technology, ask the when and the where and the why, right? Those are the real questions that, that we say, what's the right thing that wants to arrive at what moment? What's the scenario? Um, so, you know, again, I think it's, it's asking people when they say, should we buy this soft software or that one? Ask the question behind that. What is the scenario that we're trying to create? What's the before situation where there's a problem, if there's a problem? And what's the after scenario, which is the desirable one? And can we evaluate that together? How, how do we know whose desirable future is that? Okay, then what is the thing that would plug in here? Awesome, thank you. Um, I also wanted to talk about this concept that you talk about a lot in the um, chair chapter, which is access and adaptation as an ecosystem. Um, you talk about that a lot with the adaptive technologies or the lab that's building the cardboard chairs. Um, and you have a quote here, I won't read the whole thing, but the tools and materials for adaptive or diffuse design aren't just affordable and commonplace. They offer the invitation towards a make it yourself disposition and belief that the right modification is out there within the imaginative grasp of not just experts, but networked collaborations of ordinary people. And I really liked that last section, collaborations of ordinary people. That reminds me a lot about what we are, CCAC yeah. and all of our friends who are here with us today, just people who are trying to be scrappy and get something done. So yeah. I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about that kind of net network and collaborative um, element to adaptive design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And I think they're here again, it's like reframing expertise and where it lies, right? Like who's who's the expert and 
you know, adaptive design, like those folks are, they are uh, absolutely masterful builders and fabricators, right? So not even, not every, not just anybody can walk in and build one of those chairs without some training. What's interesting though, is that they deliberately keep their workshop full of the most lo-fi tools precisely to make the on-ramp to doing so possible for anyone. And they will train anyone who walks in. And they, so they, they use like, like there are technical scoring tools to make like a dent and a score in a cardboard thing. Like you can buy a proper thing called a scoring tool, but they tend to use like the back of a spoon instead. And all of that is almost kind of like performance. Like they want to say to people, like, it's not, it's actually not actually rocket science. Like you probably have a good idea for what it is that you want for your body. And not only that, but they welcome, right. Like a family member, uh, you know, a, a teacher, a, a special educator, a therapist to say, we know that good ideas come from lots of places. How can a workshop be an environment that, that, that honors the fact that those, those um, ideas can come from anywhere. I mean, what's interesting is that Alex Truesdell, who is the recently retired executive director there, she said to me once uh, in an interview, she said, you know, Sarah, there's no shortage of people who are misfits in the world and need a different structure for it. There's also no shortage of people who can build stuff. There's like a lot of people who have builder expertise. She said, there's actually, what there's a lack of in the world is the question asking people in between those two parties. Meaning the people who will say, the status quo is not acceptable. <laughs> so the, the person who will say, I, I need it to be different. And Alex would say that people, even when they build chairs for people, that a lot of folks are reticent to say, this is close, but not really right. And they crave the person who will say, it's still not right. It's still not that. Because they know, because they can build stuff, they know that they can do it a hundred ways and they want people to tell them, you know, but I think a lot of us are quite wed to the way things are, right? Which is like, look, regrettable, but it can't be helped. So there again, you know, it's like, they, they want to broadcast, like expertise can come from a lot of places and that a lot of people can, can do this work. And that's what I mean about designing a learning platform that can be networked at any scale. If only people ask those questions, which is to say, can it be otherwise? Can it be different than it is today? Yeah, I thought that was fascinating because you closed that chapter of the chair with, um, I believe, Nico going and getting the, the fitting for his chair. And there's one person in that group who's still kind of questioning, oh, could this be a quarter of an inch to the right? I, it's not fitting him quite right. Whereas his parents are thinking, oh, this is a hundred times better than what it was before. But there's mm -hmm. still one person who's saying no, but it's just not quite there. That's right. And that's uh, like we were talking about with COVID, like there are some people who see oh no, the built world is actually more malleable than you think. And she's thinking it could be better. It could be better. It could be better. And like the restlessness of that energy is so moving to me, you know, mm -hmm. not that his parents were not committed. It's just that they had not fully grasped and designers. They just hadn't fully grasped. Like you can, you know, like you can move it. Like you can, like they'll, they'll redo that headrest. Like they'll, they'll do it differently. And that, that, that's a kind of switched on moment that you have to learn actually, if you're not used to building your own stuff. Yeah, uh, we did have a request from somebody that came in. If you could speak a bit more about the street chapter and the built environment as far as like streetscape scale um, and a little bit more about that. Yeah, and that chapter opens with a, a, a partnership between an artist named Wendy Jacob um, and uh, an autistic young man. He's 20 now, but he was 10 at the time of their collaboration. And here again, I try to get in the book into some, um, you know, developmental uh, disability beyond just mobility and sensory stuff. So that chapter opens on the street with this young man um, who was 10 at the time um, and who met Wendy, who's an artist interested in disability in lots of ways. She had partnered with Temple Grandin uh, prior to this, very interested in autism, not in cures, just interested in autism and autistic experience. And um, Stephen, the pseudonym for this 10 year old, Stephen at that time uh, was quite overwhelmed in a sensory, sensory processing way with open space. So big streetscapes, plazas, beaches, even a big expanse of snow uh, in his yard. And it was quite uh, debilitating in the sense that he would, he would 
want to not leave the house or, or enjoy the shoreline or whatever. And long story short, through a, a process of experimentation, and not because Wendy wanted to fix him, but because of a shared love of exploration and exploratory use of the built environment, they built a way for him to uh, forge a path through the street using caution tape. So if he could, in a linear way, make a path and divide kind of this expanse um, into parts, that for him felt manageable and discreet and broken up. Like he would even wear, in those days, he wore glasses with clear lenses because he liked the lines. He just liked the container. And so it's so interesting, right? The, the ways that each of us um, adapt, um, build, you know, contain our experience of public space in so many ways. And all of Wendy's work is partly about that, about her interest in partnering in that way, not for prosthetics that have that therapeutic scalability about them, but for the wonder that is making our way through built space. So it opens with that story and then it, and then it blossoms into the history of curb cuts um, in a condensed kind of form and thinking about guerrilla tactics and the activism that generated curb cuts and all of the other kinds of street scale or tactical urbanism that's around now, the way that people carve out informal bike lanes and the way that what are called desire lines, you know, those informal ways that we reject the sidewalk and walk our way across the park and that eventually carves away a path. Urban planners call those desire lines. And then it ends in a very different street altogether. And that is at the, um, the dementia care, the dementia village in VASP, that's W-E-E-S-P, but it's pronounced VASP in the Netherlands, um, which is an ordinary nursing home, except it is a locked facility for memory care and it is a streetscape inside. So you go in and there is a plaza with a restaurant and a bar and a grocery store and a barbershop and a gym and a theater, and then a couple of dwellings for uh, all four older adults living with dementia. And it's a designed way to do some forms of treatment in the sense that they build the continuity of street life to try to build that reassurance about where I am in built space and therefore my connection to memory. And they rely quite a bit less on uh, psychotropic drugs, for example, for um, agitation and anxiety because they have in part, not only, but in part because they have this designed environment. So there's a way that the street is functioning for a non-physical, non-mobility purpose in a way that is just fascinating. And it's a whole trend in um, dementia care that's built on space, you know, not just on, on pharmacology. Well, and that um, nursing home, it's not just a nursing home. Like you can go there and you can go to the restaurants and, and have lunch. And it's not like others from the outside can't come in. It is more of an integrated space as well, which was truly fascinating. Yeah, it that's wasn't a bubble. <laughs> That's right. That, I think that's actually the most creative thing about that. Maybe the theater on, on its campus is rentable by people on the outside. It is locked, right, and secure with a double set of doors. But right, the restaurant is actually both internally facing to the nursing home and externally facing to the town. So I ate lunch there on the day that I visited, and there was like a mother with two young children and a business lunch happening, and also folks, residents wandering in. And the waitresses and the other guests and everyone is in agreement that this is all gonna be part of this restaurant experience. And it just means that the architecture can be like semi-porous. I mean, what an idea, right? That it could be semi-public rather than these folks are shunted away and they, there's, you know, the public space has this kind of hard um, facade against it. I just think how many more semi-public, you know, deeply humane spaces for treatment and care and just co-dwelling could we think of? I mean, my goodness, these folks are constrained by state funding too, you know, and they have visitors there from all over the world every day because folks are trying to think about this stuff. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, we have just a few minutes left. I have just a couple more questions for you. Um, Going beyond your book, which is fabulous, and everybody who's attending today who hasn't read it should. Anna holds up her copy of the book. It's great. I can see if I can get it to show up. There it is. It's a little dog here now. But what other um, books, readings, authors would you recommend people to go to after yours to also provide a great view of accessibility, adaptation? Where should we go next? Sarah holds up each book as she recommends it. Oh my goodness. Where shall I begin? 
Um, <laughs> this about us is the, you know, a lot of the collected op-eds from the New York Times' disability series, which is almost entirely first person narratives of disabled people. And this has been running for the last four or five years. So this is a collection in that form about us. And the editors are Peter Catapano from the Times and Rosemary Garland Thompson. Mm -hmm. But if you find it, it's about us. Just this year, Disability Visibility came out, edited by Alice Wong, also a lot of first person stories. Um, all kinds of short essays in here that people can read for their own edification, but also use as teaching tools. I mentioned before um, Jaipreet Verdi's book, Hearing Happiness, that came out this year. Bess Williamson's book that I lean on heavily is called Accessible America, but she also has a new co-edited book with Elizabeth Guffey called Making Disability Modern. Um, oh my goodness, I have so many. Um, but I'll just I'll just end with um, building access, which is Amy Hemry's book, Universal Design and the Politics of Disability, and Allison Kafer, who I referred to, has a bunch of stuff on Crip Time in her book called Feminist Queer Crip. All right, everybody, you have your winter reading list mm -hmm. right there. We um, can collate all that and put it all together in a list when we send out information from the program as well. So for folks who didn't catch all those titles. But... Thank you. After reading the book and seeing how many different authors you were citing, I felt like you'd have a good slate of recommendations for us all. Yeah, that um, book is meant to be a kind of paper trail to much deeper scholarship than mine. Absolutely. My last question today, again, kind of looking forward into 2021, which I think we're all very excited for. Um, what would you say if, if there was a call to action in your book for mm -hmm. folks who are working in access at in various levels at various kinds of organizations, what kind of actions would you hope people would take away and actually start making within their organizations to make the world more accessible? Yeah, well, my hope is that um, beyond any device, beyond any design, um, that we really do see ourselves, each of us in our bodies, not as the same as one another, but as bodies whose desirable future includes needs and assistance in it, that we are on the receiving end, every one of us and the giving end, and that we design actually a future without having to design all of the assistance out of our experience, but that actually in our mind's eye, that a desirable future includes assistance in that ecosystem. And I think our repulsion about dependence and interdependence, even though we romanticize the interdependence part, but our repulsion about dependence, our grasping at, uh, at uh, positions of power, our, um, our resistance to needing one another is a bigger cultural disease. And, and so, you know, if we can locate ourselves in ecosystems of care, we can ask better questions about the kinds of care we wanna be uh, collaborating to provide, right? But the, the more we think of ourselves as like in a kind of heroic version of doing for other people, right? The less we locate ourselves on that same continuum of the receiving of care. And if we want humane technologies, let's just say, this is, these are modes of exchange that are for all of us. Okay, good. What's our next right question? Which needs are in front of me? How do we frame them in, in a way that, uh, uh, that builds the future that we want? Oh, that's super inspiring to hear. Thank you so much for all of, sharing all of your thoughts with us and helping us explore, push, a little, push our boundaries a little bit on, on how we're, our frameworks concerning um, accessibility. I also want to thank all of the CCAC team who's been working behind the scenes today to keep everything rolling as smooth as possible. Again, I want to point people to our website, which is chicagoculturalaccess.org. If you're interested in any of our other programs, including that one in January on race and disability, um, and as well as having this program, which will be up and archived probably in a few weeks, give us a little bit of time to get all of our captions and resources and everything synced up. Um, it, yeah, I think that is it today. Do you have any final thoughts to share with us, Sarah, before you head out? I'm just so, I love Chicago as a city and I am so grateful for the work that you're doing. I mean, that particular kind of like, talk about networked diffuse design, right? Of like regular people making possible, you know, services and goods, like thank you for doing it really and truly. And um, yeah, here's to a better 2021. Here, here. I fully second that. 
Thank you so much for being here today, and I am going to end our webinar now. Fade to Black. White text on Black background. Access Book Club. What Can a Body Do? with Sarah Hendren. Presented by Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. For workshop resources and more information, visit chicagoculturalaccess.org. Presenting speakers, Anna Cosner, CCAC, Sarah Hendren, author, artist, designer, and researcher in residence at Olin College of Engineering. Workshop accessibility, Kathy Raycan, real-time captioning. Video editing, captioning, and audio description by BridgetMelton.com. Video fades to black.